once again we are here to discuss the energy issues the key things which we did lay out last time i will rather use the time i mean hand of my time to the minister because i think we are all waiting to hear him so sub without much ado i am not going into more details if you could join us on the stage thank you power is actually the key it is power which moves everything if you switch off power i think you can bring a country grind to a grinding halt so that's how important it is you can't develop without power we were a power deficit country it we transformed our country into being now a power surplus country we are exporting power to neighboring countries we intend to export more and we intend to add to the list of neighboring countries we are currently exporting power to nepal and bangladesh we will be starting exporting power to myanmar shortly and i believe that there is also a potential of exporting power to sri lanka will probably have and that's one of my ambitions have a regional power grid and then maybe we can think of allowing them to join us or allowing their entities not foreign entities based there but their entities to join us in the power market we have a power market which we intend to grow so in 2015 our country our government decided the prime minister decided that we'll add 175 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2022 in cop 21 paris we pledged that by 20 30 40% of our established capacity it will come from renewables now we are close to both targets that makes sense for reducing emissions that makes sense for giving us energy autonomy thank you very much there could not have been a better panel than this primarily because of the kind of the playbooks these guys have i will app set the ball rolling uh, i would like mr kakkar to uh, present his views uh, sir given that uh, you will be the largest uh, explorer of gas uh, what role will uh, your company provide and what is your way forward for this my view is these liquid fuels i'm not talking about coal but the liquid fuel and the gas they're going to be the mainstay right even beyond 2040 maybe till 2050 or even beyond that uh because of the mobility issues and many many other such issues uh so as far as the ngc is concerned uh, i think all of you will be happy to know that we are working on one of the biggest challenging projects in the east coast which is uh, generally known as by 90 by 2 it's a huge yeah, project it, it's a, it's a huge project if i'm not wrong it's a 5 billion dollar project that's what i'm saying it is a 5 billion dollar project you'll be happy to know now this this is not only gas field we'll be producing about 3 million tons of oil and at the same time about 15 million standard us gas per day from this particular field i would like to get uh, sharma saab to get into the conversation is there enough money available for this conventional power will continue to be the main stay at least for next 15 to 20 years we need to switch over to better technology super critical and ultra super critical but having said that yes. funding is not an issue for a viable project it has never been what do you do so that the states off take power we need to restore financial viability of distribution companies if you have to keep your transmission company as well as generation companies healthy so much of a competition coming in so we see the totals of the world now looking at this market we have 2040 vision and during 2040 vision starting from a level of about 2.2 gigawatts we are planning to go to about level of about 10 gigawatts uh, ladies and gentlemen thanks for being such a patient audience ladies and gentlemen for joining us for this year's edition of Uh, means energy conclave energy scape uh, mr kumar how will be this our moment of opportunity where you would like to absolutely tell the world that the technology is ours we are going to also decide what course this entire sector would take as well uh thanks upril uh, let's look uh, things both nationally and internationally what india has done so we all know that uh, we have got a target of 175 by 2022 and then uh, 225 by 2024 and we would like to go to 450 figure by 2030 and uh, when you talk about 175 gigawatt we have already achieved and installed 87 gigawatt in the country another 34 gigawatt under various stages of installation another 30 gigawatt under various stages of bidding it takes us to a figure of 151 so balance is only around 24 uh, gigawatt which we bid out and we will make sure 
that it achieved by December 2022. We were facing a lot of headwinds uh, last year mm -hmm. and uh, we had the problems regarding uh, renegotiation of PPAs coming out of the state government of Andhra Pradesh. We had a problem regarding delayed payments. Uh, we had a uh, problem regarding the land. We had problems regarding transmission. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was a period of uncertainty. But uh, with all stakeholders together, today I'm very happy to say that we have been able to overcome mm -hmm. all these problems and sort out these issues and build a new confidence among the investors. We strengthen our PPAs. We have de-risked the sector. Mm -hmm. We told them if force measure happens, what is the political risk or the non-political risk and how they will be tackled. We have also told them in case their duty changes, then change in law would mean what in exact monetary terms in the recent Sura tender. Right. We have also, through the instrument of LC, ensured that the payment would be made in time in future. We, we sat with the stakeholders. Uh, sorry, I'm interrupting you here, but you talked about states and as Amit mentioned about the state risk. When you're talking about, since you're you are the center, what about the older payments, A, and also what the center says, how do you make the state see reason in that? We have this electricity as a subject. We all are aware of this. We do have legacy views. Number one, where states are facing genuine financial problems, we would like to extend them loan through ERIDA, PFC, REC. There are the legacy views. But then, in case a state does not want to pay it, then we have got the legal, you know, our, our judicial system is so strong mm -hmm. that the person who has consumed power, he has to pay. Number three, we are also bringing out certain uh, amendments to the Electricity Act. Once we will bring in these amendments to the Electricity Act, mm -hmm. number one, RPO, the Renewable Purchase Obligation, Obligations. would become a must and the penalty would be stringent. Number two, PPAs would become strong enough and they would not be we will not be able to revisit number three there will be timelines provided for doing certain things like adoption of tariff again i'm saying the the, the magic uh, my magic words are de-risk investment absolutely. absolutely so this is one way as far as the international things are concerned more and more our power capacity would come in future and it would be led if you believe me or in my opinion i'm saying would be led by solar number one Number two, in future, what is going to happen? There are certain countries which have which have got a higher solar potential. There are certain other countries which have got a lesser solar potential. In other countries, wind is higher, wind is lower. So, got different combinations on the RE potential levels. And this is what I stated in Irina in the during the assembly. I said, stage is going to come where we are going to help each other in sharing RE power. What our Honorable Prime Minister said, one sun, one world, one grid. So solar is a potentially across, it has potentially across all, Absolutely. all, all the countries. Absolutely. And we can help each other right. by right. meeting our peak power and peak demands. So similarly, if you see the combined RE potential, so RE potential also can be shared by uh, among each other a country and yeah. to have a total green grid across the globe. And also kind of the, when the common commonality of economic interests are there, also the world becomes a much more safer place as well. Uh, on that note, I would like uh, Sanjeev to uh, come in. Sanjeev, uh, tell me where, where is this entire story going? Uh, thanks, Utpal. Thanks for uh, having me on the panel. So I think as uh, Minister also pointed on his keynote address, and as uh, Secretary Kumar also mentioned, that we are dealing with certain legacy issue in the power sector. But I think uh, what we are generally as an industry excited about is the future vision, which we clearly see from the, from the government perspective, as Minister talked about, that we are looking at the renewable energy. We are looking at a situation where more and more electricity is used in the traditional fossil fuel fired situations like the cooking or the mobility. So as we keep on producing more and more of renewable energy, we have to find out uses for consuming this energy. And uh, I think cooking, electric mobility, farming sector, etc. are clearly very good examples where solar 
uh, in particular from the renewable energy sector can play a good role so what we are looking at is like a energy transition and we have to we are living in this world where we have a legacy system of fossil fuel fired plants and we are moving into a cleaner fuel side and we have to integrate the other forms of energy into the whole thing and find out that how all these things are going to coexist so they are the role of the technology and some of the things as uh, as sir talked about uh, secretary kumar talked about uh, sharing with the neighbors so one example of that probably at a micro level is sharing some of the power that we produce on the rooftops with the neighbors so how can we possibly promote that because we are talking of setting up uh, solar plants in india possibly sending the excess power to nepal or bangladesh or to myanmar into a regional grid get mr grover into this sir uh, we have talked about he has talked about new forms of energy nuclear has been there uh, we do around 6000 odd megawatt of nuclear there but there's a huge expansion program which is out there so where do you see nuclear playing its own role given that it will be absolutely the can help in providing the base load when it comes to that level so what is your uh, sense to that let me first uh, take this issue of uh, clean energy as a whole in an academic context all the studies which were done particularly in uh, 90s brought the concept of health externality and recognized a certain uh, technologies as uh, clean and that's where the whole movement started and technologies recognized as clean were solar wind nuclear and uh, large hydro uh, that made the public realize the importance of uh, uh, these technologies as against uh, fossil fuels but starting from 90s even now globally about 81% of energy we get from fossil fuel and we have to move more and more towards this clean uh, uh, technologies we are moving further and trying to integrate these clean technologies in the grid certain other issues are being studied by energy economists energy technologists and they are still not come to industry level and let me touch uh, two of those issues first and then i'll come to details about nuclear one issue is what is being called as energy return on energy invested to extract certain amount of energy to reach it to the end user certain amount of energy has to be first invested every this ratio is different for various technologies and gain to society obviously is energy out minus energy in this particular factor has to be brought in the policy discourse and here i must say for coal large hydro and nuclear eroi is very high it's not so far other technologies so this is one thing which makes that those technologies which have a high eroi has to be a part of the energy mix so as to ensure that eroi of the grid as a whole is high enough second issue is the fact that various technology options are being compared using levelized cost of electricity generation that does not consider the component of intermittency as a result what we are saying is that okay uh, this is the cost of uh, solar electricity that is at the generator end at the consumer end it's much higher because there is a grid in between the consumer and, and the generator. generator and if we keep on neglecting that cost again we'll end up with wrong policy decision considering health externality it is a must that we integrate more and more solar wind and nuclear in the grid but all the remaining issues should also be considered in the policy perspective and we should also uh, sort of look at uh, countries like germany where they are trying to integrate more and more renewables and the cost of electricity there for the consumer has doubled how do you still uh, kind of look at nuclear in the backdrop of a fukushima which happened well uh, yes fukushima did happen uh, we have to acknowledge that learn lessons from that and move forward in india we i have analyzed everything uh, not in india everywhere in the global level also lessons from fukushima have been well debated well analyzed and uh, we have to move on from there i would like to get neeraj in because uh, the one thing that an investor looks at is the stability 
of policy. We are talking about a rules-based regime here. And if a billion dollars get pumped in, obviously there's a, some kind of a country risk which gets done. In fact, in one of the early, uh, earlier sessions, we talked about state risk, which was something uh, now is getting calibrated. How do you see investors looking at this? Because I'm sure that when you, anyone, if you're putting in a one dime into this, it would be obviously modeled against what kind of risk is someone getting into. Thanks, Upal. I think uh, on a lighter note, to start on a lighter note, I think nowadays clients uh, reach out to us and say, you know, we'll engage you first if you answer two or three critical questions. Which are? And which are, one, how do I get paid under my PPA? And what is the <laughs> sanctity of that contract? Two, how do I ensure there is no curtailment? Three, how do I ensure I get land? So if I give the right answers for these three questions, I get engaged. So that's how, what that situation is right now. And to be honest, to hear the Honorable Minister and to hear Honorable Secretary, and I've you know, heard him many a forum, it is extremely encouraging and there is very little that you can fault the MNRE or any of the central agencies with. But the challenge, again, like we all discussed earlier today, is not with the MNRE or the central government. It is with the state government, right? Now, how do you ensure compliance with whatever is being, uh, what are the objective or the vision of, of the central government is? And to my mind, I think from what I hear uh, from uh, Honorable Secretary is that maybe the Electricity Act amendments is the panacea to all of these ills. You know, maybe that will have enough and more provisions that will uh, ensure compliance by the states, ensure discipline by the states. Because what we're lacking here is discipline by the states. And the fact that, you know, as a lawyer, it's heartening to hear sometimes that, you know, the government itself is saying that if your rights are not enforced, go litigate. So it's very heartening to hear as a lawyer. But the point is that these companies, their business is to generate energy. Their business is not to go to court. Now, the, each time they go to court and the, the amount cost. of time and cost aside, I mean, the, the time and effort they spend in no, you're being very modest, You're being modest, but still. No, no. <laughs> sure. But uh, we, we, we get by. <laughs> so so the, the time and effort that they spend litigating for their genuine rights, which are enshrined in a contract, if that time is spent in actually doing what they do best, which is developing more capacity or, you know, uh, achieving our, our stated objectives, that's much well spent. Amit, you wanted to make a point. So this is exactly what I was going to mention, as Secretary Kumar mentioned, the biggest drawback of solar and wind has been that is infirm power, right? Mm -hmm. So when we get 2.5, 2.6, people say, okay, this is not a good comparison because it's infirm. But as Secretary Kumar mentioned, the recent prices on RTC, round the clock, floating solar, solar wind hybrid with storage, they have come around four, even the peak power. So if, if 2.5 and 6 were not the right comparison, four is, which is again cheaper than the new coal. Mm -hmm. So that has completely proved that a firm renewable energy power can also compete with coal. Now, these are some of the few transformative initiatives like RTC, floating solar, which as a World Bank, we are also learning and talking to our colleagues, especially in Africa, where they can learn from these initiatives. Sir, given that uh, you are heading the only, uh, the first multilateral uh, organization headquartered in India, what has been your experience been? Your, what, is, uh, what role can India play out there, sir? And what examples do these countries look at us for? Uh, well, you know, when uh, ISA itself was created, India was very clear that it is going to play uh, a diplomatic leadership role of mm -hmm. having the first organization. You know, India and France both, uh, if you look at the financing side, India has put $2 billion of uh, uh, Exim Bank soft loan for the member countries. France has put $1.5 billion. So this itself is a big push for solar projects in these member countries. And uh, we are, of course, now talking to the UK, Japan, uh, Netherlands, those who are members now. And, of course, a little later when the first amendment comes through, then a whole lot of countries will become member, like Germany, Spain, Italy, they're all waiting. But the amendment has to be ratified by 30 countries, only 20 countries have done it so far. So one is the financial leadership that uh, uh, comes, the diplomatic leadership I talked about. And uh, the other thing which, uh, uh, you know, uh, MEA, MNRE, and even the PMO of, uh, from the host country, that is India, they're pushing is some sort of, you know, technology leadership. We are planning to form a global task force on technology research and development. And that is where India can play a tremendous role. And most of the member countries, uh, you know, if you look at them, they, they expect a, uh, you know, a lot more technologies to flow to the, these countries because they, they are not very sure that uh, the quality of uh, things uh, that come to these countries are actually the best of the state of the art matters. Yes, sir, sorry to interrupt you. I would like to ask you this question. Uh, given the reporter in me, I can't help it. 
will pakistan become a member of iic well today uh, pakistan is not within the tropics we are not within the 121 countries but so we all but once the amendment comes through right. nothing prevents pakistan being a member of iic because pakistan is a un member and as per the framework agreement which has been signed in iic is uh, you know the uh, the the constitution of iic says uh, and at that point it will stand amended saying that any un member country who would like to promote solar can be a member so they can apply they can become a member uh, i would like to thank the gentleman on the panel uh, for making time for this